New reporting in New York Magazine continues to trace the questionable allocation of funds donated to the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, finds that $6 million in money fundraised by the group for fighting racial inequity has gone towards a swanky 6,500-square-foot Southern California home purchased in cash in October 2020. The home features more than half a dozen bedrooms, bathrooms, a pool, a soundstage, parking for more than 20 cars, according to reporting from Sean Kevin Campbell. In a statement to the New York Magazine, a BLM Global Network Foundation spokesperson called the property by its nickname Campus and wrote that the property was not, does not serve as anyone's personal residence and was purchased, quote, with the intention for it to serve as housing and studio space for recipients of the Black Joy Creators Fellowship. BLM Global Network Fund was awarded tax-exempt status from the IRS in December 2020, two months after the house's purchase. Joining us now to expand on his reporting is investigative journalist Sean Campbell. Welcome to Rising. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And so you've, you've really gone behind the scenes with this reporting here. And I'm, without, without getting into who, who your sources are or anything like that that might expose anything, are there people inside the organization and cl close to the inner circle that are frustrated by some of the spending? And, and is that why we're learning about it? Because you now having done a lot of reporting, these real estate transactions are basically impossible to uncover unless you get unless somebody flags them for you because you you know you can create LLCs with names that have nothing to do with anything and mm -hmm. there are billions of properties in the world and it's a real needle in a haystack situation yeah so i will say in this particular case too uh the L the property was purchased by an individual who you could trace back to the organization okay. uh dane pastel uh, who um through those records i could see that it was purchased in cash and this was purchased with cash from BLM, there's BLM funds. It was uh, roughly $5.9 million for the property. Uh, but to your first question, yes, uh, people that I've been speaking with have been growing, have been getting more and more frustrated with the organization. And a lot of it has to do too with that these are issues that have been simmering within the organization for years. People have been raising questions about where money is going, how money is being spent across all sectors of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. And I also want to be clear here that when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, even if we might use it as shorthand, for this conversation, we're talking about the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. It's problematic that the movement has been named after this or has been named in conjunction with uh, uh, this group of people in this organization. But this is just one organization that has really put itself into the limelight as being the face of the movement. And that has created a lot of problems, created a lot of funding problems that have diverted money from local organizers and other organizations. And this is one of you know, how some of the funds are purchased. When I did my first look into it, there were a lot of murky details with how money was being spent, where the money was going. And this is a clear indication of when the money is given, how it might be getting spent. We're talking a few months after the death of George Floyd. We're not seeing money, this, this amount of money going to political action, to policy making, to local organizers. We're seeing this money go into the purchase of a house. And this is two weeks after they leave their financial uh, or their fiscal sponsor. So within this short window of time, we're seeing a huge purchase. And these aren't things, and is, this isn't like these issues weren't being raised before, that local a uh, activists, local organizers needed money, they were desperate for money. These conversations stretch back years. So yes, people do get frustrated with this. People who also come in, they might be frustrated or just really concerned when they're working on certain things and only have pieces of information. All of these add up, and over time, if you talk to enough people, information starts to come up. It, it looks to me, and, and again, congratulations on your, your story. I think the reporting's terrific. It, it looks to me like a question of priorities, that the, the founders want to spend money on almost like a hype house or like a, like a in, influencing kind of social media, that kind of sort of lifestyle or approach to activism, which, mm -hmm. okay, that's an approach. I think a lot of people would have 
reasonable criticisms of whether that you know translates to real change or is, is a good use of money versus more traditional organizing. And yeah, you know, they seem, based on uh, your story, to be kind of like defiantly standing by that strategy, which obviously leads to some degree of personal enrichment. Um, is, is that the kind of conflict at the root of this? I think so. Uh, and I also do want to be clear that the influencer house, we learned of that after we had approached them with questions, and we knew that that was something that they had been uh, concocting in response to uh, me asking, hey, so I found this house and it's connected to Dane and Dane's connected to uh, Ms. Colors and uh, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. So uh, that's in a way a little bit retrospective uh, or, um, you know, post uh, my asking the questions about these things. And then there's also um, that the activist videos will say, I'll just put a big quotes around that. These activist videos aren't even just the, the popular one that we quoted in the article where, or popular now, uh, of them sipping champagne and eating amongst the lavish, the lavish bread. Uh, this also includes on Patrice Colors' private YouTube channel, which those videos have not been taken down, but her reacting to uh, TikTok videos of Karens and uh, baking a peach cobbler with her aunt. Now, I think even in the broadest sense, that really stretches the imagination for these being activist style influencers. You can say that Patrice Coolers is an activist and she's producing these videos, but some of these videos really do not touch on activism at all, in my opinion. Right. What, what was damning about your reporting was the fact that you were able to get their internal correspondence about how to respond to somebody. And that's how you know that an organization is kind of in crisis, when the reporter is able to get their hands on the deliberations about how we handle this, these questions. And as you point out in the piece, there, there was a real tension between two different responses that they wanted to give. On the one hand, mm -hmm. they wanted to say that this was a safe house for people who were facing legitimate security threats, which, okay, that could be a plausible explanation. And then on the other hand, they wanted to say that this is a hype house that they're going to use to produce music videos, other videos, uh, you know, podcasts, and otherwise create art to further the movement. And as, as they observed themselves in their deliberations, those two things are intention. You know, you can't mm. you can't do them together. And so, and then the final damning piece was they're saying, well, we actually need to make sure that this is legal before we say this. And this is what seventeen months after the property had been purchased. So, what's your sense of what the property was genuinely being used for? So, I can't speak to anything outside what's in my reporting. But I do know that it had been used, again, by Patrice Colors to make over a dozen videos, some related to activism, some seemingly not as much related to activism, some tangentially related to activism. And I do know that she stayed in the residence for a number of days. Uh, and also, um, Melina Abdullah had stayed in the residence for a number of days. Uh, and these stays could have stemmed from legitimate security concerns uh, where there were threats in their life or they received uh, threatening notifications from people. Uh, but I will say that six million dollars is a lot to pay for a safe house. Uh, you don't even necessarily need a safe house. You only need it for four days. Staying in a hotel, a motel even, um, would be even if you were to stay in a Malibu resort, which has also been connected to the organization, uh, that would be maybe um, two, three thousand dollars for a few days in one of the best rooms in uh, a Malibu resort. So that is a reason. Um, but as you were saying before, if you're having also an influencer house, you're saying it's an influencer house, and you also want to keep this as a private safe house, there's an obvious tension there because how are you going to get people in and out of this residence that are their whole job is to broadcast? what's going on in the residence, what they're creating to the largest possible audience. That's the antithesis of a safe house. Uh, and with that being said, you know, we didn't disclose too much information about the house. We know it exists. They know it exists. We have the address. We can say all of that, but we also don't feel that it's necessary to 
release too much of that information because people have received death threats. There are legitimate security mm -hmm. concerns involving people and any people who may or may not be in and around the residence, which we would not want to see. No, absolutely. But, and, uh, and again, this, this influencer house thing was not something that I had seen or heard from any of the people I talked to, any of the documents I'd seen before I contacted them. And the memo that I received kind of showed as much. It was one of a number of responses to how they were going to deal with my questions. They, they, a point in the memo is that initial response before we ever respond to them at all, let's just break the story somewhere else. <laughs> to, to that old move. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sean Campbell. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. We'll have more rising after this.